Hey everyone, it's Rasikas here. After getting yet another iceberg video in my YouTube recommendations, I wondered to myself, are there Splatoon icebergs out there? The answer to that question is yes, which makes sense because despite Splatoon's cute and colorful appearance, it has a lot of lore, some of it with bizarre or creepy implications. But when looking at these iceberg memes, I felt like many didn't really go as deep as they could, or threw in baseless theories for the sake of being edgy. So I decided to make my own iceberg and further beat this meme into the ground. At first, I just wanted to add some points from some popular icebergs out there that I thought would be fun to explain, and then stack a few things of my own on top of it. Because many of these icebergs were missing weird stuff from the Splatoon art books, especially the Japanese-only Haikata Walker, which I have translated a lot of. But then I went to Twitter for some suggestions and I thought of too many things, and it spiraled out of control. So behold, the ultimate Splatoon lore iceberg. I ranked points based off of how well known it was, or how cursed it was, and I posted this and I got a lot of questions, and some thought I made things up for clout. I admit some things are worded to sound edgy, but even then, I promise you, everything on this iceberg has some sort of explanation based in canon. And that's what I'm about to show you. Let's begin. The rest of Inkopolis. I suppose this one comes from the question, where's the rest of Inkopolis? What's the rest of the city like? I mean, it's right there in the background. From a game design point, the developers are only showing us what we need to see right now, which is places where the squid kids go and turf. But looking in the background and reading the lore makes it very clear that Inkopolis is a fully functioning society that isn't exclusively centered on turf wars, even though those are culturally important. I really wish we could go and walk around the rest of the city, though. It seems like a really cool place. Adult Inklings. I see some people ask, why don't we see any adult Inklings? Where are these kids' parents? The answer to this one is really simple. We just don't need to see the adult Inklings. They certainly do exist, though. I mean, here's an adult, 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 adult. The adults are just off doing adult things, like going to work. Inkopolis Square is just a small part of the city that's really popular among the youth, so not a lot of adults are hanging out there. Plus, is it really all that unusual to see high schoolers hanging out together after school without parental supervision? Not really. Inklings have no bones. Sunken Scroll number 5 confirms this. Inklings are not smart. Following the release of Octo Expansion, it was confirmed that Inklings just think that Octolings have funny hair and are not a totally separate species. So many players considered Inklings stupid for not being able to tell the two apart. Though if you think about it, their education system kind of tells them that octopuses are extinct, and it's kind of rude to ask why someone's hair looks weird. So can you really blame them for not knowing? Still, the game criticizes Inklings for being consumerist hedonists, so they might not be the smartest bunch around. Jellyfish touching the ground. Throughout Inkopolis, we can see jellyfish doing this. The art of Splatoon 2 confirms that they're just having a drink. Pearl says the F word. In session 9 of Marina's chat room in Octo Expansion, it was revealed that Pearl was in a heavy metal band and she sang a song that was apparently very vulgar. The Squid Sisters are not sisters. They're cousins. The Great Zapfish Easter Egg. During the last minute of a round at Piranha Pit, you can see the Great Zapfish swimming around. Splatoon is a post-apocalyptic shooter. This is at the tip of the iceberg because, although it's cursed, it's the one fact I see thrown around all the time to shock people who have no idea about Splatoon lore. Splatoon takes place during the Mollusk Era, which is 12,000 years after the human race went extinct due to the rising sea levels caused by global climate change. Remnants of human civilization, including human remains, are a fun little fact of life for the Inklings. By extension of that, mammals are extinct, except for Judd. This is because Judd was cryogenically frozen 12,000 years ago. This extinction of mammals is another fact often stated in the game and by the developers. Yes, I think that includes marine mammals, and no, I refuse to accept Marina's Norwell landlord. The Octarian Power Crisis Octarians aren't just mindless bad guys. After losing the Great Turf War 100 years ago, the Octarians were forced to live underground. Sunken Scroll number 6 reveals that their homes are deteriorating and they're suffering through a power crisis. 
They're an oppressed species trying to survive, and they had a very good reason for taking the Great Zapfish. Playable Octolings planned from the start. In the first game, hackers were able to make the enemy Octolings playable. Although the hair had clipping issues, the fact that the models had unique eyes not seen at all during the single-player campaign, and the hair was textured and coded to function properly with different ink colors, raised suspicion that there were plans to make the Octolings playable at some point. Developer interview confirmed this. Ink vanishes after battles. I think this one is a little dated, but I do remember seeing some people ask, where does the ink go? How do they clean it all up? Well, Sunken Scroll 14 in the second game confirms that there's airborne microbes that disintegrate it. Octoling Asymmetry The left and right ears of the playable octolings are shaped differently. According to a developer interview, this was designed to mimic how real-world octopuses have a funnel on one side of the body. We're living in a simulation and free will is a lie. This is just a reference to a bizarre fourth wall breaking piece of dialogue. Lil Judd is a clone. His cells were placed in Judd's cryo capsule in case Judd did not survive the freezing process. Lil Judd's cells multiplied after a janitor accidentally pulled the plug on the machine, leading to his birth. Lil Judd has an inferiority complex because he knew he was a clone from the moment he was born. And rumor has it, he's waiting to backstab Judd. Races and allegories. I think this one is pretty clear to those who played Octo Expansion, but here's what I think is one of the most glaring examples of this. When Captain Cuttlefish says, I don't see species, it's a play on the well-meaning but ignorant phrase tossed around, I don't see color, and he also says, oh, you're so articulate, which, you know, is another real-world microaggression. Octavio's humanoid form. It seems that some people forget that DG Octavio is actually an octoling with both an octopus and a humanoid form. You can see this humanoid form in Sunken Scroll 16 in the first game, and in Marina's chat room. Salmonid Octarian Treaty This treaty is mentioned in the Salmonid Field Guide and in the second art book. Basically, the Salmonid exchange their power eggs and in return receive Octarian technology. We can see evidence of this with how power eggs are scattered around the game's story mode, and in Salmon Run, the Griller uses the same tracking technology as the Flutters, the Gushers are the same, and Scrappers use Octarian shields. Offensive Gesture from Inkling in Mario Kart 8 In the first version of Mario Kart 8 for the Switch, the Inkling girl makes this gesture, which is offensive in parts of Europe and Latin America. This was quickly patched to an inoffensive fist pump. Splatoon was a Mario spin-off. From the humble Tofu prototype, Splatoon went through many stages of figuring out what kind of characters the game should use. One idea pitched was for the game to be a Mario spin-off, taking advantage of Yoshi's many different colors. Of course, this was scrapped. Rabbits was a long-lived idea for what the main characters of the game should be, leading to the rabbit prototype. It was scrapped once the devs realized squids made much more sense. The fox and tanuki statues in the plaza, as well as Judd, are all remnants of when the game was centered on rabbits. I guess the devs liked them so much that they figured out how to work them into the squid world. Laughing Statues This is a rather infamous easter egg. In Splatoon 1's Museum di Alfonsino, during Splatfest, the statues laugh. Ringing Phones This is an easter egg that occurs in Inkblot Art Academy. I think of this as a less creepy spiritual successor to the Laughing Statues. Post-boss battle screams Both before and after the hero mode boss battles in Splatoon 1, and the Octo Samurai battle in Splatoon 2's hero mode and an Octo expansion, these disturbing sounds can be heard. When Splatoon's co-director, Tsubasa Sakaguchi, was asked about this, apparently he had no idea it was in the game. Every Splatoon band member has lore. Nearly every single piece of music in Splatoon has a fictional band or musical artist attached to it, as well as album art to go with it. If there's a picture of the band member, there is lore for them. While the official Twitter and Tumblr has given us a little bit of information, High Cut a Walker expands on this a lot more. Scrapped hairstyle concepts. 
Shown in the art books, there's a lot of hairstyles that never really made it into the final game. Here's a few of them. I thought this guy with deep fried hair was pretty interesting. DJ Real Soul Identity. DJ Real Soul is the musician behind the music that you hear in the shops. The identity of DJ Real Soul was never actually confirmed, but based on the possible shoe pun in the name and Sunken Scroll number 6 in Splatoon 2, DJ Real Soul is probably Bisque. Attempted contact with aliens. Sunken Scroll 22 has a parody of the Voyager Golden Record and talks about how Inkling sent this disc into space in search of other intelligent life. Top half of Skull Bandana. Despite not being able to see it in game, the Skull Bandana has a top half. This seemingly contradicts with the fact that Inklings don't have bones. The reason why this is fully textured is unknown. Fully modeled unreleased gear. There are several pieces of gear that never made it into the final game. Some of it was just for beta testing purposes, some of it was redesigned and given different coloration, and some of it was completely scrapped. An infamous example of this is this Native American headdress, which likely would have stirred up some controversy. Another infamous one is the Nils mask, which is kind of creepy, but I wish we got it. There's also this Judd mask, which appears in the Grisco manual, but never made it in the final game. Splatoon 1's Octolite armor and boots seem to have been planned for release for Salmon Run gear, but for some reason they never were released, so unfortunately we only have the goggles from that set. One that I find particularly bizarre is how the Tentacles helmet, a gear item from the first game, never made it into Splatoon 2. It was fully modeled and even shown off for a promo for a Splatoon 2 update, but for some reason it never got released into the game. Captain Cuttlefish can't produce ink. In the Art of Splatoon, it's mentioned that Inklings past the age of 50 begin to practice a ritual called sun drying in order to extend their lifespan. This explains why the captain is about 130 years old. A piece of dialogue in Octo Expansion confirms that Inklings lose their ink as they dry out. Sanitization creates zombies. In Octo Expansion, sanitization causes a loss of free will and Marina notes that sanitized Octarians don't have a pulse or signs of life. In a developer interview for the first anniversary of Splatoon 2, a very direct comparison to zombies is made. Inconsistent traffic flow. What side of the road do they drive on in Nicopolis? Moray Towers? Left side. Starfish Main Stage? Left side. Okay, so far so good. I see a pattern. It's like Japan. Arowana Mall? The right side. Albacore Hotel? Also, on the right. Sheldon, in the Octavio boss fight cutscene, drives on the right side as well, so I'm leaning towards the right side being correct. But yeah, inconsistencies. Active Bear Area. These signs around the ruins of Arc Polaris are one of the only instances of a real-world language used in-game, showing that it's a remnant of the human era. What does it mean? Is it related to Mr. Grizz? Did a bear attack the humans that were here? Who knows? Hopefully the next game has answers. Mari's pet. In Octo Canyon, we can see that Mari has a pet in a cage. All we know about it is that Callie caught it and gave it to Mari. We don't know what species it is. Seriously, what is it? 8-Ball Ranked Mode. Splatoon 2 has a few scrapped ranked modes. There's a scrapped ranked mode that involves pushing an 8-Ball towards a goal on the opposing team's side. It seems pretty similar to Rainmaker to me. There's another ranked mode called Rocket, which basically involves shooting at a rocket, and the more damage it takes and the amount of times it's launched determines how far it goes to the other team's side. Also, the rocket drops a weapon called a rocket nozzle. The models used in these videos are placeholders, so this isn't exactly how it would have looked. The Book of Madai. This is a cryptic religious prophecy from the Sunken Scroll 17 in the second game. When smoke rises from the Seven Rings, the pink fish will emerge from the sea, devouring all the creatures of the land. The Book of Madai, Chapter 10, Verse 10. We have no idea what this means. Illegally modified weapons. From the appearance and how overpowered they are, I think it's pretty clear that the Grisco weapons are illegally modified, and this message from Grisco Industries really hammers it in. But this isn't the only instance of weapon modification. In the second art book, there's a concept for an illegally modified E-leader. Inklings went to the moon. If you were to zoom in on the moon that appeared during some Splatfest in the second game, 
You can see there's this little squid-shaped thing. Octarian Spies at Manta Maria In the second art book, there's concept art for this boat intended to patrol the waters around Manta Maria. It's an octoling spy boat disguised as a fishing boat. However, I checked the stage recently and I don't think this made it into the game itself. All I could see was the sailboats, the weird military-looking ship, and the Jamstack boat. I even tried looking through the game footage from before the update that added the Jamstack boat, and still nothing. Maybe it's in Salmon Run, but all I've seen in the background are the same looking fishing boats. If you can find this exact boat in game, please let me know in the comments. Turquoise October Backwards Messages In music by Turquoise October and Splatoon 2, which is the fictional band behind the music in Octo Valley and Octo Canyon, samples of Callie's music can be heard when some songs are played backwards. <laughs> This is pointing towards Callie's brainwashing. DJ Sango In Haikata Walker, it's mentioned that Agent 3 takes up rapping and becomes a DJ called Sango. There's some concept art throughout Haikata Walker that shows Agent 3 in this DJ outfit, but it was never mentioned in game as far as I'm aware. So I like to imagine that this is something that they started doing after the events of Octo Expansion. Pearl was a member of Sashimori. Sashimori is one of the fictional bands behind the music that we hear in Turf Wars. I think the song of theirs is pretty memorable. This band doesn't have a vocalist. It's actually this young octoling named Paul remixing Ancient Human Records, which is why the vocals don't have the same gargly quality that sea creatures have. However, before Paul was in the game, they were actually a wall of sound metal band with a singer with a very powerful voice. They kicked the singer out though for being too domineering. Sound familiar? In an interview, Splatoon creator Hisashi Nogami was asked if Pearl was their old singer. He said to leave it to your imagination. I think that's a yes. The power core is a zapfish egg. In two of the escape phases in Octo Expansion, we see this energy core which has the face of a zapfish. Personally, I was a little bit confused about where this stood in the life cycle of a zapfish because we do have this diagram in the Schellendorf Institute, and this thing doesn't match anything on there. I was kind of thinking that maybe it's filling in that question mark spot on the diagram. Well, Haikata Walker confirmed that the core is a zapfish egg. Mating lures. On the armor in the first game, there's a squid fishing lure attached to it. In the first art book, it's further explained that this lure is a hip accessory designed to attract the opposite sex, and that it's an item almost everyone has in this world. Just an interesting little tidbit about squid culture. Salmonid are not barbarians. Despite appearances, salmonid are intelligent species, as evidenced with their ability to trade with the Octarians, build and operate machinery, and produce complex music, among other things. They also have their own culture, and a seemingly high regard for the natural order of life and death. There's an interview which I translated that outlines their cultural attitudes in a more detail, but I'm not going to go too into this because I already made another video about it, so if you're interested in obscure salmonid lore, go, go watch that video. Inklings are cannibals. This is the wording everyone throws around, but it's really not that edgy or weird in the context of the Splatoon world. Maybe. There's one interview with Nogami where he talks about what food inklings eat, stating that they don't eat the meat of mammals since they're extinct, and also no milk for the same reason. He mentions that they eat veggies, birds, and fish, and that inklings could eat squids, which is what led to the cannibalism comparisons. But these fish and squids exist in the same non-sentient form as they do in our world, and it's clear that although inklings are squids, they've definitely evolved to be much different than their counterparts in the ocean. Relation-wise, it'd be more akin to us eating monkeys, except it's like the normal thing because fish normally eat each other anyways. Like, oh, Krusty Sean, he's feeding you his brethren, oh no, he's feeding you parts of his own body. Like, no, there's, there's shrimp in the ocean, it's the same form as in real life. Tying into all that, Nogami also talks about how the food chain exists in the Splatoon world as it does in real life. Like, there's all these predatory fish species walking around on the surface, there's no good reason for all of them to suddenly become vegans for some weird moral reasons. Like, no, they're going to eat fish like they always have. And if we're throwing in morals, eating fish from the ocean would probably be the more morally okay way of doing that. 
However, exactly how the food chain functions in Splatoon is open to interpretation according to Nogami, and it seems like these darker interpretations are not entirely out of the question. In another interview, he says that, In Japan, we think of squids and octopi as being... Maybe natural enemies is too strong, but they compete against each other. They use each other as food sometimes, and we've continued those thoughts as we made our world. The world he's talking about being the Splatoon world, of course. So maybe the sentient species can eat each other? More on that in a second. Salmonid meat in Mako Mart. Salmon fillets can be seen in the stage Mako Mart. In an interview, Splatoon director Seita Inoue comments on this with, The relationship between inklings, salmonid, and jellyfish has not changed since before they evolved. And although inklings don't eat jellyfish, that's not limited to salmonid. So that does seem to imply that this is salmonid meat. Gen 83. This is just Marina's name when she was in the Octarian army. This raises some questions like, what does gen mean? Generation? If it does mean generation, then who's the other 82 generations? I loved Octo Expansion, don't get me wrong, but my biggest critique is that it gave us this interesting new setting and gave us a very character-centered story that raised even more questions and gave us very few answers. We still don't really know much about Octarian culture after all these years, and that kind of sucks. Lake Biwa Map There's a brand that you can see throughout Splatoon 2 that has a map outline of something in its logo. It's actually Lake Biwa, which is a giant lake near the Kyoto Prefecture where Nintendo's headquarters are. Something I don't think I've ever seen anyone else point out, though, is that the small inkling language text underneath seems to read Shiga, which is the name of the prefecture that Lake Biwa is located in. Carla was a denizen of the deep. Carla is the scaly foot gastropod basis for the band Sashimori. Apparently, she's very silent and nothing is known about her past or even how old she is. Scaly foot gastropods are a deep sea species, and in some concept art in Haikata Walker, she was going to be someone you'd see on the deep sea metro. Of course, this idea was scrapped and her design was reused to make her a band member. The Jellyfish Hive Mind. Jellyfish are weird. For one thing, they reproduce asexually, and we have this very bizarre piece of official art depicting this. But they're also all part of a hive mind. In an interview with Splatoon director Hisashi Nogami, he says that the jellyfish aren't really individuals. It's more like they're all parts of a larger organism. So even when you see them playing in the pool, or when you spot two jellyfish lovers hanging out by the poolside, it isn't that they're actually jellyfish in love, but more like they want to behave like or impersonate what it would be like if there were jellyfish lovers. Nogami also mentions the jellyfish that watch the Inklings battle. What if they are actually the sponsors behind these battles? Maybe they're the ones supporting the whole turf war industry. So jellyfish may be pretty powerful in the Splatoon world. Mari is related to Tony Kensa. In Splatoon 2, Mari's kimono bears a family crest which, according to the second art book, belongs to the Kensaki family. Tony Kensa, the gear brand with the cool black and white clothing, is named Tataki Kensaki in Japanese. The Kensaki family on this crest may be the same Kensaki family behind the clothing brand. Deciphered Inkling Language Some of the Inkling language does resemble real words, be it in English or in Japanese, but most of it is straight-up gibberish. There does seem to be some internally consistent fonts, however. In Haikata Walker, there's a page showing the fonts used in Octo Expansion, but for the first time we actually get an Inkling language font. Using this as a reference, we can actually read some of the text used in game. Some of it is sensible but corrupted, and some of it is weird English placeholder text. Wedding portraits? Another Tumblr user actually deciphered one of the fonts used in game, and that showed it was also internally consistent for the most part. They made a very long post detailing the process and showing examples throughout the game, but unfortunately this post is deleted. I made this quick graphic showing what examples specifically I remember from the deleted post, like from the I Ship It logo and the claw machine in the square. Numbers 3, 7, 10, 15, 17, 18. Deadfish, the fictional DJ behind much of the music in Octo Expansion, numbers her music from 0 to 19. However, for an unknown reason, the numbers I just listed are missing. Arc Polaris was a failed space colonization mission. Arc Polaris is, of course, the name of the ship that crashed in the Salmon Run stage, the ruins of Arc Polaris. 
Judging from the English lettering on the ship and the area surrounding, it's heavily implied that this is something that was built by humans. We know that humans tried going underground to survive the rising sea levels and failed. But also, these ruins show us that they did try to go into space too, and failed. The Ark in the name is likely in reference to Noah's Ark, and maybe the humans tried to take some animals with them to space, and one of those animals may have been a bear, judging from the active bear area signs scattered around the stage. Who knows. Fax Machine Origins This fax machine, which is basically a religious artifact, delivers the Splatfest themes. We do know where the fax machine messages come from. The explanation given is that basically, words from our time have, I guess, been recorded, and then those messages fly into space, bounce off a planet, and then return to Earth 12,000 years later. There's still a lot of other questions, such as, where did this fax machine come from? Did it belong to some important human, or is it just a random one that happened to be functioning when the Inklings dug it up? Is there some relevance to the bouncing off a planet thing? Did some humans actually successfully make into space? Honestly, I think it's more BS Splatoon science to explain how many of the themes can get kind of fourth wall breaking, but I could be wrong. The SOS message. For New Year's in 2020, we received this official piece of art. The reflection in the water resembles SOS, and to prove that this is no coincidence, a closer look at the waves read, Save Our Salmon. Unlike some of the other insane theories that come about from official art, this one does really seem to be foreshadowing something plot-relevant for the next game. No Child Labor Laws This one is kind of edgy sounding, but all these 14-year-olds are able to walk right in and work for Grisco, which is a sketchy job. Also, the Octarian army employs child soldiers. Thousands of dead test subjects. As revealed in the end of Octo Expansion, Tartar kills and blends up test subjects in his efforts to collect biomass to create the perfect life form. This is known to those who finished Octo Expansion, but it's very disturbing, hence its placement. I originally had this as over 10,000 dead test subjects, and I know I saw some other icebergs say 10,007 because Agent 8 is number 10,008, or 10,006 when remembering Isopadre was also a test subject. But these numbers both aren't really accurate, because the only ones who were blended up were the ones who finished all the tests because those were the perfect specimens. A developer interview revealed that many test subjects did not make it to the end and dropped out and presumably were not blended up. So we actually don't know how many test subjects were killed. Not 10,000, but it still has to be a lot. Non-cephalopods can turf. It was revealed in Haikata Walker that Kuze from High Tide Era, Lo from Bottom Feeders, and Ryu Chang from Sashimori all play in a Rainmaker team together. As we know, Rainmaker is an ink-related sport, and these fish guys are not ink-based cephalopods. So there may be alternate means of having non-ink-based creatures to play ink sports, or there's ink-free variants of these games. Pearl destroyed the reef. In a very early trailer for Splatoon 2, we can see that the stage, The Reef, looks a bit different. Notably, the bridge is made of wood instead of stone. In a developer interview, it is stated that Pearl's powerful, infrastructure-damaging voice is the reason why the bridge is now made of stone. Unused Octarian Executioner In an early trailer for the first Splatoon game, we can see this odd-looking Octarian design that never made it into the final game. With the black hood, this design feels very reminiscent of an old-timey Executioner. The Professor The Professor is a mysterious, long-dead human. The Professor is the man who cryogenically froze Judd, alongside Lil Judd, ensuring his survival. The AI Commander Tartar also mentions that he was built by a Professor, which led some people to theorize that the Professor who froze Judd and the Professor who built Tartar are the same guy. But there's actually no need to theorize this, because this is a fact that was confirmed in a developer interview. One of the crate-busting stations in Octo Expansion involves breaking crates into the shape of Judd, which is supposed to hint at this. I don't think the Professor is straight up evil or anything. This dude clearly liked his cat a lot, and his intent when programming Tartar was for the next intelligent life form to not repeat the same mistakes of the human race. It was just Tartar's own loneliness which caused this programming to disregard those intents and become genocidal. I can't help but wonder if there's any other things in Splatoon that'll come up that was also created by this professor. Agent 8 actually dies. So during the escape phases in Octo Expansion, whenever you die, you notice that there's a lot more panic from Captain Cuttlefish and the like. Unlike the stations, there's no respawning. You actually die. A developer interview confirmed this, saying that when you die in the escape phases, the game goes back in time so you can redo it. 
Marina, Paul, and Deadfish are all connected. A passage in Haikata Walker directly acknowledges this connection. Rumors float about regarding the relationship between Deadfish, Sashimori's young octoling DJ Paul, and Marina from Off the Hook. First off, the same thing is drawn on the hats worn by Deadfish and Paul. Are they blood relatives, or do they just like the same brand? Also, Marina and Deadfish are both DJs, so it wouldn't be too surprising if they performed together in the past. Also, apparently, Marina is friends with Paul according to some Japanese dialogue from the Fam vs. Friends Splatfest. Are you ready to join something bigger than yourself? When you're about to enter the quote-unquote promised land in Octo Expansion, Tartar asks if you're ready to join something bigger than yourself. Some eagle-eyed fans noted that this piece of dialogue is weirdly similar to something Mr. Grizz says to you when you first try to get a job at Grizzco. Very suspicious. Mr. Grizz's identity. Mr. Grizz's identity right now is of course unknown, as it'll probably have some more relevance in the next game. It is widely theorized Mr. Grizz is a bear because of his name and the fact that he talks through a bear statue radio, and with all the bear references in the ruins of Arc Polaris. Although there's all these signs pointing to this, personally I really hope he's not an actual mammalian bear. I would just find that disappointing more than anything. It's the one thing that literally everyone is predicting, and I really want the devs to throw us a curveball in terms of Mr. Grizz's identity. I mean, this dude is trying so hard to keep himself a secret from the players. Why would he have his name and statue look just like him? It's just way too on the nose and silly. For all we know, Mr. Grizz isn't even real. There's one dev interview that brings up that Mr. Grizz might not even be monitoring Salmon Run, and his voice is just a text-to-speech thing. And this leads to the possibility of Mr. Grizz being an AI, which would be thematically fitting with the are you ready to join something bigger than yourself thing I just talked about. I have a few ideas about Mr. Grizz's identity, but nothing I feel super concrete about just because, of course, I could be wrong. Personally, I like to think he's not even a real guy and just a company persona managed by some shady figures. As long as he's not a bear, I'll be happy. World War 5 what we're told in-game is that the rising sea levels from global warming is what caused the mass extinction of all mammals. But a comic in the back of the first art book reveals that it wasn't just gradual global warming alone. Apparently, humans had five world wars, and during the last of these world wars, someone launched a nuke into the polar ice caps, which caused the ice to rapidly melt. Labor strikes at Sturgeon Shipyard in a description in the second art book for Sturgeon Shipyard, it's mentioned that the aging facilities have led to poor working conditions, which has led to frequent strikes. There's a few posters and a newspaper in-game that seems to reference this. At least 20 different countries exist. Warabi, the octoling beatsmith from the band Dispair, has a biography in Haikata Walker. It's mentioned that he has toured over 20 different countries in a single year. So yes, this is direct proof that there are many different countries in the Splatoon world. Giant Doors in the Deep Sea Metro In the Deep Sea Metro, we can see the subway doors, and this door in Central Station, for example, is very large. I do remember seeing some people pointing this out when the game was released, and just how weird it is. There is a passage in Haikata Walker that explains this. Basically, the deep sea denizens have much bigger heads and bodies compared to the octolings, so the infrastructure has changed to accommodate them. The Amosis Schellendorf posters. Scattered throughout the deep sea metro are these posters, which bear a heavy resemblance to Sheldon's grandpa, Amosis Schellendorf. Is this proof that he's still alive in the deep sea metro? Or is it just a cool art movement? Or are these posters not even of him and it's just some other old dude? Inkopolis Square Crime Rates In a passage in the second art book, it's revealed that Inkopolis Square used to not be the best neighborhood, and it was a place where minor crimes would frequently occur. That is, up until it was renovated about a year and a half before the beginning of Splatoon 2. Tartar's Corpse is on Mount Nantai This is one where it's kind of edgy sounding, but there's a bit of truth to it. In this panel from the Splatoon manga, Marina puts Tartar's busted phone body on Mount Nantai, which is a place that's been referenced a few times in game, but we've never been able to see. I'm a bit wary about calling stuff from the manga canon, but there doesn't really seem to be anything that contradicts this yet. However, some people have noticed this old phone in Octo Canyon. I don't think this is Tartar, as the events of Octo Canyon and Octo Expansion occur independently of each other, and I think the phone would have been more busted up if it was Tartar. I think this was just foreshadowing to Octo Expansion, with the oxidization of the copper being a similar color to sanitized ink. Clownfish are second-class citizens. 
This one is also kind of edgy sounding, but hear me out. Pariko, who is the sea anemone girl from the band Chirpy Chips, has this black clownfish on her head. According to a passage in Haikata Walker, this clownfish is dying of neglect. This is a bit alarming, as we know that clownfish are sentient, with how Annie's clownfish, Mo, would say rude things to you in the first game. So are clownfish just treated like pets even though they're intelligent? What is going on here? Dead Clam Graffiti You know this cute looking blobfish graffiti that you can see around Icopolis? It is not a blobfish. It is a clam. And most of them are dead. In Haikata Walker, there's an interview with the fictional artist behind this piece of graffiti, as well as with another graffiti artist who drew intestines on everything during Splatoween. Remember that? I think this interview gives some really interesting insight on how Inkopolis culture has a different definition on what's appealing or cute. Like for example, it's mentioned that in the Splatoon version of the Olympics, they had an endearing mascot which was a parasitic nematode. This is probably one of the most obscure things on this iceberg in my opinion, because as far as I know, I'm the only one who translated this and not a lot of people read it, because it is so long. So I'll link it to you in the description if you want to read it. Judd is an immortal telepath. Judd is weird. This is a cat that is 12,000 years old. The artist Splatoon 2 confirms that the professor injected Judd with an immortality serum, so yes, the Judd and those 2,000-year-old drawings in one of the Sunken Scrolls is the same cat and not a clone from several generations ago. It's also confirmed that he telepathically talks to the Inklings, which makes sense when you look at his dialogue in-game. He just gives you a meow, and then what he's actually saying is in parentheses. Judd is also very wise. According to a comic telling his backstory in the first art book, his innate ability to judge how much a side is winning was used during the time of humans, by what looks to be some world leaders or military generals deciding where to launch some missiles. Unexplained Geomagnetism There's a few pieces of dialogue in Splatoon 2 that mentions mysterious magnetic fields which affect Inkling's ability to super jump and salmon run, it affects Pearl's phone, it distorts time and space, you know, stuff like that. The reason for this has not been explained at all. I actually made another video talking about this more in depth, so if you want to hear my theories about this, go go watch that video. Tartar Beta Concept This is something that's somewhat well known, but it sure is creepy. God, look at that thing. All the fake eyes and teeth in the blender, the sausage arms, the meat grinder. This would have been such a cool final boss. There's a few other concepts that are not quite as scary, but they are pretty cool too. Nils Statue Digestive System You know how all the escape phases in Octo Expansion are named after internal organs? Wanna see how that looks on the outside? Yay! I think a more accurate way of describing what I had in mind for this point would be... Nils Statue Exposed Internal Organs? I'll talk more about the digestive system thing in a bit though. Fun fact though, the Japanese names actually tell the functions of the different areas. The coccyx phase is a prison. The veli stage is a control zone. The belly phase is the disinfection site. The intestinal phase is called the hormone corridor. The diaphragm phase is the control tower. The peristalsis phase is called the flow passage. And the spinal phase is called the spinal central hole. The Kamaboko logo is designed to look like, um, poop. This is why I called the image in the previous point the digestive system. The caption on the previous piece kind of translates to an image showing how the internal structure of the human body has been applied to that of the Nils statue. While looking at the statue, we can't help but wonder, are we just something that gets digested through its body? The rumor that the Nils logo represents a stylish turd suddenly has some truth to it. Some handwritten text nearby reads, then digest everything and knead it well and it'll turn into one thing with an arrow pointing to a turd. The phrase I translated to stylish turd was kakoi unko, so if you speak Japanese, take that as you will. Great Turf War Weapons of Mass Destruction This came from a point on a different iceberg that I saw that was instead about Octarian weapons of mass destruction, which I assumed was an edgy reference to the great octa weapons and how those were made for war, but I didn't think that was obscure bottom of the iceberg worthy. So I expanded this to include what the Inklings have created, in a comic in the back of the first art book, we actually get this rough depiction of the Great Turf War. We can see this funny little Octarian aircraft carpet bombing whatever's below, but we also get these very cryptic, massive squid things imposed over a burning cityscape, 
which gives off a very War of the Worlds feeling. I'm quite sure these are supposed to be inkling weapons of mass destruction. These aren't the only examples I have, though. In the Splatoon manga, there's a legendary splatter shot designed by a Moses Schellendorf, which is capable of blasting a hole in the side of a mountain. Although it's from the manga, which I'm a little iffy about the canon status of, it does appear it was designed by one of Splatoon's concept artists, so I thought it was worth mentioning this. 247 siblings. In Haikata Walker, it's mentioned that Nishida, the herring guitarist for High Tide Era, is the youngest of 247 siblings. This is at the very bottom of the iceberg because of its implications and the questions it raises. Herrings in real life can lay tens of thousands of eggs, so that shows that the sentient fish creatures in Splatoon have similar reproductive strategies as their counterparts in the ocean. Real-world fish tend to just lay their eggs, abandon the children, and hope those children don't get eaten. But surely, Inkopolis society is a bit more different than that, right? Like, there has to be laws regulating this. Are these two parents watching over all these children? Like, there's no way two parents can watch over all these kids. Like, this would have to be a community effort, so there isn't child neglect going on. Like, are the streets of Inkopolis filled with unsupervised tiny fish children? Is this what Nogami was talking about with the food chain situation? Like, were some of these children eaten? Was there many more eggs that didn't make it? Is this partially why land has been fought over so fiercely in Splatoon because of this overpopulation for all these sentient fish being able to lay thousands of eggs? Okay, I'm starting to get into baseless theory territory, but I do have a theory surrounding this and how it could be regulated. Maybe I should make another video about it, but still, what the fu- Deep Sea Rave Missing Persons in Haikata Walker, details are given about a giant rave that was held in the deep sea. During this event, DJ Sango and Marina had an 8 hour long rap battle. Pearl and Captain Cuttlefish also had a rap battle, and it was filled with unairable, unprintable language. The event was t attended by 60 billion? Yes, 60 billion. The number used isn't even a real number. When people use this number in Japanese, apparently they usually mean a, a billion. It's maybe an exaggeration, but if 247 siblings is anything to go by, I don't know, it could be literal. Still, it was attended by way too many, and there are still people missing since the event. Wow, thank you if you watched all of this. Um, some of you might disagree with the placement of where some things are on this iceberg, and that's fine because I believe some things could be switched around too. But honestly, I don't really care anymore. I eventually reached a point where I got sick of moving things around and I ran out of room in some tiers, and that's how it is. But yeah, I spent way too much time compiling all this information and editing this, not to mention some of this info is stuff I personally translated from interviews and art books. So if you enjoyed it, I really appreciate if you followed me on Twitter, or liked, or commented, or subscribed, or whatever YouTubers say these days. I do hope to make more Splatoon videos in the future because I enjoy talking in people's ears about how weird this game is, so uh, yeah, I hope you look forward to that. Bye!